You're listening to the Sketchnote Army Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Rohde, the author of the Sketchnote Handbook and the Sketchnote Workbook. And this is the podcast where I chat with sketchnoters and visual thinkers and try to understand what makes them tick. Hey, are you looking for the ideal sketchbook for your sketchnoting practice? The Sketchnote Idea Book is the sketchbook designed for sketchnoters. Equipped with no bleed, no show through paper, you can take almost any marker or pen you can throw at it. Get 10% off with code ARMY at airship.store. Hey everyone, it's Mike, and I'm here with Maggie Appleton. Maggie, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you. Hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's quite an honor. Um, been a big fan of your work. Uh, following your your gardening site, I don't, it's not about gardening, but it's about information gardening. I heard you on my friend Jorge's uh, podcast and really became fascinated and thought you might be a really good candidate for the Sketch and Army podcast because you operate visually, and you know part of what I'm trying to do is continuing to push the boundaries of like who we speak with that is more visual mm-hmm. oriented and not so much sketch noting. In that, I have the sense that as we mm-hmm. stretch ourselves we might see ideas in other people's work that's outside of our normal work that could influence our work and take us in new directions. So that's my mm-hmm. drive to continually expand sort of the footprint of who we speak with and bringing interesting people to listen to. So with all that, uh, tell us who you are and what you do, Maggie. Sure. Um, well, I will say I do have a, a history of sketch noting, but I currently um, work as a product designer Mm-hmm. for um, a company called Illicit, spelled mm-hmm. with an E, like to elicit something, not yeah. to, be, to be illicit, yeah. <laughs> which is confusing, a uh, confusing name. Um, but we are using um, language models, the new kind of things like mm. ChatGPT and, and other models similar to that to help scientists and researchers speed up the literature review process, which is usually a very manual kind of intense, oh, yeah. reading 10,000 papers to synthesize what science mm-hmm. currently says about a particular topic. And so my current work, I feel like is a little different to my historical work that I think probably relates more to what listeners of this um, podcast are interested in. But I was an illustrator and a sketch noter at conferences. And I, for years, have been making visual essays online, which I still do, which are filled with animations and illustrations and hand drawn stuff. And I traditionally trained as an illustrator. So maybe that side of things will be more interesting. I definitely think that all ties into my current work more as an interface and product designer, but it's definitely slightly different to what I used to do. Mm. And especially too, with all the the discussion and, you know, top of mind of chat GPT and these AI tools that are integrating every place, right? If you see it in mm-hmm. Microsoft Word, it's, you know, the, it has arrived, right? So yes. <laughs> and I think that yeah. that intersection is really fascinating. And, you know, probably there's concerns, you know, from sketch noters or illustrators, like when will I be replaced by Mm -hmm. some AI. I mean, right now, I I think it's limited, but um, Mm -hmm. I think that that could change. So it might be interesting to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. I think um, that that whole issue of like, well, how does this affect working illustrators and designers? I'm I'm certainly concerned about. And also, yeah, just how we relate to them. I think it's it's a sort of controversial topic in a certain way because it's so loaded with people's livelihoods and yeah. emotions around what it means for humans to create versus machines but it's worth like getting into that stuff because it's, it's fascinating as someone who used to make visuals and now is playing with these tools to make visuals mm-hmm. i mean we're all sort of you can't ignore it you know yeah yeah it's kind of it has to be discussed to some degree so that that would yeah. be fun to get into if you'd like to um mm-hmm. i'm really fascinated about your origin story we of course always mm-hmm. kick off the show with this uh, so that we have a sense of where you came from and how you ended up where you are as both informational and also aspirational for us to say, you know, if she can do it, I can do it too, right? That That's the kind of sense that I get a lot of times from these. So mm-hmm. why don't you yeah. let us know like how you got, you can go ba- all the way back to when you were a little girl drawing with crayons or whatever you did. If you want to go mm-hmm. that far back, you certainly can. Sure. Uh, I suppose it does go that far back in that I was always mm-hmm. obsessed with drawing and art and visuals as a child. Um, it first turned to just, you know, art class being my favorite thing and sort of like winning sort of terrible art competitions as a child. Although I did once win one by tracing drawings out of books and then won the award and felt like no guilt because I didn't understand that that was like maybe not something you should do. Um, 
so I was encouraged very young to be to be like, oh, you are a visual design kind of artsy person. Um, but I was also interested in other things. So I didn't go to art school in the end, although I sort of maybe regretted that a bit later. I retrained later on in, in more visual stuff. But I was also really into like politics and I found cultural anthropology in high school mm. and loved that. So I ended up studying that for my undergraduate degree. But always was doing design stuff on the side. It was like, and and I would say web tech stuff. Like mm. I learned HTML and CSS on Neopets at like age 13 mm. and like, had, you know, was very lucky to have parents who were programmers. So they gave me laptops and kind of let me roam free on them. And I had a lot of liberty to grow up in the 90s on the web, mm. you know, just kind of immersed in the early web culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and that um, led up to like now I'm able to be both uh, a designer and a developer kind of as a hybrid. And it kind of goes back to just getting into that stuff very early. Um, so I think I had a lot of support across lots of like visual domains growing up. And then after I graduated from university, I had also been like, you know, again, building websites on the side, designing logos for people, getting into photography. I was still doing all this sort of in like side hustle, you know, how you make mm. money in high school and college. Yeah. But I didn't, it, this will sound weird. I didn't know that was a profession, like a serious one. I didn't know you could be an illustrator or a mm. graphic designer. I had never heard of that as, mm. as a discipline. I didn't have any designers I knew, nobody at my school really knew anything about design as like a, a career. Mm -hmm. So I graduated and was like, well, I have no idea how to make money, <laughs> uh, you know, and waitress for a bit. And I had this anthropology degree and was just a bit lost. But then was like, well, I'll make websites for people because they'll pay me for that until I figure out how to like get mm -hmm. a real job. Uh, and I, ne I never got a real job, right? I just did freelance web design. <laughs> That's great. From, <laughs> from my early 20s onwards, and then started working for digital agencies and creative agencies and realized there was something called interface design and realized mm. people got paid to do illustration and design full time and was like, Oh, great, this is what I'm going to do. You know, this is now viable <laughs> as an income source. Um, so yeah, I stayed in that for the first couple of years of my career and then joined a, a um, company called Egghead, which does developer education. Mm. Uh, maybe in my like mid 20s um, as a full-time illustrator it was like mm. I had been making illustration work on the side and posting it to Dribble, which was very big back then yeah it was yeah. sort of the site right back with Dribble, like heydays that was really wonderful it was small and supportive and I yeah, met yeah. all these friends through it it was kind of a beautiful place um and so I was posting illustration work there very regularly like hand-drawn sketch note stuff but also very like polished Adobe Illustrator, like mm. vector illustrations, was kind mm. of my specialty. And I would layer in Photoshop. So there was a mix of sort of digital painting and vector work, which was really fun. Um, but anyway, this company uh, that did um, developer education reached out and they said, hey, we make courses, you know, online about JavaScript and, and HTML and CSS. Uh, and we want you to come do full time illustration work for us. We need covers for these courses. We want visuals made of the, the content within them that help explain the concepts. Um, and I was like, oh, perfect. This like fits really well. I was kind of getting burnt out on agency work and like mm. kind of demanding clients. And if anyone who's worked at agencies knows. <laughs> yeah, pretty much all tricky. you get, right? <laughs> yeah, it's quite stressful. So I took this job on and I ended up staying with this company for five years um, just because the team was wonderful. Like the CEO was just one of my biggest mentors, Joel Hooks. Mm. He was like, he's wonderful in supporting me in whatever direction I wanted to grow. Um, so while I was there, I went from illustrator to art director to then getting into UX and product design because mm. that was also an avenue I wanted to explore. Um, but the whole time I was doing these very sketch note esque, but I, not necessarily by definition because I wouldn't do them on the spot. I was they were sort of planned more yeah. graphic more illustration. illustration. Yeah, exactly. But of concepts in the courses that that were taught on the site, so I would mm -hmm. be trying to explain really difficult technical topics like asynchronous programming or like how, mm. how, what, how react works or just these things that are really code heavy which mm -hmm. got me to really learn a lot more about programming but yeah i found it fun because you had these like super abstract non-physical concepts and you had to draw a thing mm. to explain them yeah <laughs> so I, I had a lot of fun with it and i learned a lot in the practice because i got really into metaphors and metaphor design and how you create physical representations out of abstract ideas. Um, and the whole thing was just, yeah, it was like a boot camp in, in visual thinking, I guess. Like I really had to, and there weren't that many good courses or books to pull on, I felt like. I felt mm. like I was kind of making it up as I went. Yeah. Um, 
but it, it, it taught me a lot it was just very like you know you go back to kind of first principles thinking i guess you know if you're drawing okay. something to do with time you don't just jump to drawing clocks you think about okay time is like a, a we talk about it as water we talk about it as yeah. fluid you go back to language and you find what imagery you can pick out and then just play with with physical imagery until you find something that works um so i, I loved that job it was it I kind of grew up there, I guess, as a designer mm. and illustrator and kind of defined my style. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that probably brings, yeah, and then after that, I had moved into, after four years of doing kind of intensive illustration art direction there, I got really interested in UX and product and kind of switched into that and mm. then moved on to other companies. Um, but I think those years were really my kind of core, like sketch noting illustration, sort of visual mm. design growth phase. Mm. Um, and then, and now I, I still do it when I, I write a lot online and I make these visual essays and I yeah, still have beautiful. that skill set to pull on. So I can still just whip out illustrations when I mm. want to, to help explain my work, but it's not like the core thing I do all day at, as like a job anymore. Hmm. Well, two interesting observations and it'll be interesting to see how you react to these. Number one, I feel like since you were born, you've been a hybrid. I think mm. I've been, I'm a hybrid as well. So I've got it both technical and visual components mm -hmm. i think you probably are even more technical than maybe i am but um that is really fascinating because everything you said about your story it seemed like you were always having your feet in two worlds right mm -hmm. even even thinking about like doing uh websites for people on the side because you didn't really realize that that was a thing which then led mm -hmm. you to the actual doing that as a profession um but that you've always had sort of this mix of two things and then the second observation is I'm really curious about your anthropology degree as it aligns with user interface and research and all those kind of things. Cause that seems like a natural fit to me, but I don't know, maybe, maybe, or maybe not that those two things overlap. And I think ob observing people in general is really informative. Right. So. Yeah, that was another one that I would kind of, once I really got into my career and I realized that UX design was a field, I had this moment of where I was like starting to read about it and like learn about it. And I started just being like, Hmm, this is like anthropology, but yeah. with a different name. Yeah. Yeah. And I, not that I felt sort of bitter about it, but I was like, Oh my gosh, nobody told me this was a job when I graduated with this degree mm -hmm. and felt just sort of lost and had no clue how to turn it into a, a useful job. And, you know, it, maybe it would have been six or seven years later when I would have first learned what UX design was and sort of connected the dots of like, oh, mm. ethnography and user research and, and UX. And like, this is all shared skill sets. But I maybe I graduated, I think I graduated too early. It was around 2012, mm. 2013. UX design was not a thing back then. It was, it vaguely existed, but not in the way it does now. Yeah. Like there were no boot camps. There were many books. I think it was just too early. Um, but I love that it kind of came full circle. Like now a lot of what I studied in school definitely comes back around in terms mm. of practice and theory. Uh, and also in my like research and writing, like I will always say my degree was not at all use useless. It seemed it mm. for a hot minute, <laughs> yeah, I yeah, yeah. but it really wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. You know, in my experience, I had a somewhat similar experience. My dad didn't know what, and I didn't know what design, you could be a designer. Until mm -hmm. I got into college mm -hmm. and there was a degree path for that. It was print design back in those days. Mm -hmm. So he convinced me to go into printing because I had this technical aspect. Dad always had computers around. We weren't afraid of computers. We So, you know, my first job as a graphic designer was also as the system manager because I managed the backups and restored people's Eaton cork files and whatever. So, again, you see the parallels between this hybrid. But my tech, my technology stuff was more on the printing side. So I got really good at mm. understanding printing and how the technology works. So as a designer, it kind of influenced my print designs because I knew what would work, what would likely work and what probably wouldn't work on a press. And then I could go to the press checks and talk with the pressmen and say, and they were all men, by the way, um, <laughs> talk with the pressmen and say, you know, can we do this? Or I, I could talk inte somewhat intelligently. At least I thought maybe I was an idiot to them. I don't know but it mm -hmm. seemed to help me sort of manage both sides. And it sounds like somewhat, somewhat similar for you in a slightly different, you know, combination of things, visual and technology in a different sense. Yeah. I mean, that's incredible that that parallel exists, but I suppose it always has between, mm -hmm. well, yeah, someone designing the material and the person who 
operates the technical equipment yeah. that like creates that because I definitely find that parallel being like a, an interface product designer the fact I can program I think I can write front end code and I know enough JavaScript that my discussions with developers are very different I think mm-hmm. to, to maybe other designers or the way I work just from what I've understood of other people's workflows like I just write the code you know I'm not going to do a ton in Figma first and then have some mm-hmm. handoff process and like all the details and important stuff gets lost in the middle there, like yeah. exactly what's possible and how you could problem solve or change the design because of what's technically possible or harder or easier. Mm-hmm. Um, that to me is all kind of the core of the work and the way that like, I, I understand that like interface designers used to be programmers, like they were the same job, I think back all through up to the nineties. I don't know when it really split. Yeah. Um, and then they became two separate roles and then not that everything got worse, but like it, it changed the way websites and software is made because there was a split between mm-hmm. like the design person and the programming person. It seems to me like would, would this seem like a fair thing is when uh, an industry, if you want to call it industry matures, there's this tendency mm-hmm. for roles to really get super de- op- like hyper defined almost. Like I just do UI design. Like I don't even talk about the UX stuff. Mm. I've seen that before, right? Like I just push the pixels and make it look beautiful. Right. Then you have the UX person and you have the research person and you have the developer and you have to have this, you know, when you separate to all these sub, you know, disciplines, that what well, that mm. means that you have to amplify the communication between those. Because like you said, that's where stuff gets lost in between and, you know, you have to do corrections or whatever the case. So. In that, yeah, in that sense, yeah. you know, you, you have the advantage of knowing that. So on the, you know, on the one hand, developers can't say, well, you know, that's too hard. Like, no, it's not. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I made this or you can do it this <laughs> way. Right. So you, they can't like pull the wool over your eyes. Not that they would, but, but also right. gives you the ability, like you said, to take, you're sort of working with the materials mm-hmm. in a sense as almost like an artist would use a charcoal and paper, right? Like mm-hmm. you get a certain output when you use those two things. In your case, using code in this certain way with these browsers, you can also achieve an output, which has some variables, right? So, I don't know. I'm just yeah. now, I'm just, now I'm just rambling, but um. no, that's great. <laughs> I mean, I want to build a fat for a sec because it, it, you're right. It's so interesting, right? When you try to scale up making software, you have to have these specialized roles. I'm thinking huge companies that make you know sophisticated software. They can't have everyone be a hybrid, so they have to have. Yeah the researcher and the UI person and the UX person, and they break them all up, but then they have all the PMs in the middle or whatever that do the communication. Right. right. Um, but I think I've loved, maybe I'm thinking it's more relevant even just on like a personal making stuff for yourself or creativity exploration level. Like when you understand both the material, you're making something in very intensely, like you really know the technical side of, yeah, everything from charcoal and paint to programming. Mm-hmm. and you're trying to express ideas through visuals or creatively, knowing both makes you able to explore in a much more interesting way than I think mm-hmm. someone who only knows one side of them. Um, so it's, I think it's almost more interesting at the, at the experimentation level, at the push and the boundaries, you know, the doing weird stuff for your side mm-hmm. project, not necessarily professionally, because I agree that, yeah, if you're really building big stuff, you're going to end up with specialized roles. Um, but there's something magic in the, in the intersection of the two. That might be a good argument for side projects, right? You talked about how yeah. side projects are so important to you as you're mm-hmm. trying to figure out what am I doing here? And it yeah. actually became your primary thing because you were exploring, right? It be- you realized, mm-hmm. well, hey, this could be the main thing. And I think for people listening, you know, having little side projects like, you know, I do a podcast because I find it interesting and it challenges me to solve all these problems. So it's you know, I'm not going to quit my day job and just do the podcast. It's just not, that's not how you do this, but it's made me much more aware. It's built a network of people that I can talk to. And we have all these interesting discussions that are now in the public record that people can be inspired by. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you're listening, c- consider a side project. If you've sort of eliminated that because you don't have time, you know, every side project I ever worked on always ended up coming back in some way to my main work as a designer, right? Because I'm exploring these things and suddenly something comes up. Hey, can we do t-shirts? So yeah, I've been goofing around with t-shirt design. Mm. Let's use this platform and we'll, you know, I've got experience. Suddenly I can make t-shirts for my team. Right. So that would be a, a practical application. For yeah. You. Yeah. So um, I definitely like 
I'm full in, in agreement on that. So I've had a, a personal website where I write these essays or like mm, notes, mm-hmm. you know, I call it a digital garden. I kind of written a piece about that philosophy. I didn't come up with the term, but I wrote kind of a history of it. Um, and the, my personal website, I genuinely started it just as like, well, I wanted to just build something, you know, I, maybe this was like, God, five years ago, it, not even that long, honestly, the first part of my career, I didn't really have like a blog or website of any sort mm. up. I had like a portfolio, but not somewhere I was writing and publishing work. Um, and then um, it not that it's taken off, but I have a pretty good readership at this point. Mm-hmm. But every single job that I've had for the past couple of years has come through people reading my work first and understanding how I think and understanding how yeah. I do design. And I have gotten just it, like it would be immeasurable to talk about the career benefits I've had from yeah. from having this website and writing in public and putting my work in public and and writing regularly. And just showing people how I think in a very like practical public way. Mm-hmm. I just get, you know, invited to speak at conferences and like invited to events and make new friends and really get way better job offers than I'm qualified to have kind yeah. of thing. Um, all just because so few people really do put their work in public and, and yeah. share it. And the ones that do are, ex- are perceived to be more um, skilled or qualified and unique, yeah. which I don't think they are. But, but it, you know, it does just bring you so many benefits. Yeah, that I mean, that's another argument. I'm at, I've maintained a blog since 2003 or something like that. Nice. And I know in a, in the peak of like when I was doing more independent, I did, used to do logo and icon work. Mm. I would describe in real detail, like, okay, what was the challenge? How do we deal with it? Mm. All my sketches would get posted with all this descriptive. So it was a pretty long post. And I've heard on more than one occasion, customers who they looked at those and hired me because they could see like exactly what you said. They could see the way I thought about problems and then knew that they were a fit. That was a fit for what they wanted. So I think that's the, one of the advantages of course. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I mean, it's another argument I think to don't put all your eggs in a, you know, social media basket, as we've seen yeah. social media platforms can go nuts and you might, they might become radioactive and maybe you don't want to be irradiated. So it's probably good to have some place that you own your domain, your space that you control. You know, if, if you're not like Maggie, who's really good at coding, maybe it's a Squarespace site or a something else site, at WordPress, just something where you have control, total control over it. So that if things change, there's this home base that people can at least find you and get your, your unfiltered and original thought, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely a huge fan of, there's a community called the Indie Web. Do you know them? No, no. Oh, they're wonderful. So if you just like Google IndieWeb or, or your listeners should, uh, their whole thing is just promoting people mm. having their own independent websites up and, nice. you know, you can, and publishing to them and like syndicating to social media, right? Like publishing stuff out to Twitter and Mastodon, right. but from something you own and control. And they have yeah. a wonderful wiki full of tools and advice and huh. support and meetups. And they're really, they're fantastic. I'm such a big fan of the indie web. They're just trying to say, we should all have our own independent websites and we shouldn't be behest to whatever Elon's doing. Yeah. I, I've, you know, I have many indie uh, blogs that mm-hmm. I read still regularly. I didn't know that there was an organization promoting it. That's really cool. I would like to go there and probably find some yeah. tools that could benefit <laughs> me. So that's yeah. our, that's our little PSA for today is, uh, mm-hmm. you know, get yourself a website, even if it's a Tumblr or something, yeah. you know, yeah. to, to get a space for yourself. Um mm-hmm. Because if you rely on, you know, other networks, they have different motivations than you may have. So, yeah, which most of the time you don't realize until things go crazy. So anyway. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's really fascinating to hear sort of this transition from, you know, where you came from and how I really love it that you studied this, this topic, anthropology, which at the time you're thinking like, why did I waste my, you know, these (laughs) years on, but now it's coming back to be beneficial. And that's really cool. And um, it might be interesting now to talk, get into the discussion about large language models, AIs, and kind of the work you're doing as a product of it. Like, how, you know, many of us might think, well, you know, it's chat GPT. It's a chat interface. How complex could mm. that be? Or it's, you know, I do a, a prompt and an image comes back. But I think it's a lot mm-hmm. more complex than people realize dealing with that. And also thinking like when the, when the, tool comes back with it like how do we represent it those kind of questions i imagine Mm -hmm. you must be working on yeah yeah so it's my job right now is kind of fascinating it's challenging some days in a way that's quite stressful um because 
language models, right, are this, this brand new thing. Uh, I mean, they've technically been around for about four or five years, but, you know, they kind of exploded onto the scene about a year ago when ChatGPT came out, which was this, yes, very accessible chat-based interface mm -hmm. for an underlying piece of technology that isn't necessarily chat-shaped, but it was a very kind of easy, familiar uh, interface that a lot of people just kind of uh, caught on to, right? They went, mm -hmm. okay, I know how to use this. Um, but there are many ways we can kind of use language models as uh, a backend to different interfaces. Uh, it's not too different to computers in general and programming and programming is a type of AI in a certain way. You know, you can like do logic and you can say if this, then that. Um, and we've, you know, kind of had this artificial intelligence with us for a long time, but yeah. the language models are a kind of totally new scale of it, just a much more capable, much more complex, much more mysterious uh, tool that we've invented that um, in my talks on it, I try to describe like how they're different. And I say they're a bit like very advanced language calculators. You can, hmm. Be like, okay, we have taken all the words humans have ever published to the internet and condensed them down into a model, um, which we use, uh, it's called a neural network. Um, and then you can, you know, ask it to say things back to you, or you can query it in certain ways being like, okay, if you take the word um, queen and you minus the word man, you get the word king. There's like these weird, mm -hmm. like math calculations you can yeah. do on it that like show you how language is related, which is like fascinating. Um, and they're also good for other things, right? You can get them to like read 10,000 words and summarize it, like sometimes fairly accurately. And that's like, well, that's totally practical mm. in a way that like just chat chat um, interactions aren't. Um, so the way that we're exploring it at the company I work for, Elicit, is this like focused on helping um, researchers and scientists. So people who have to spend like lots and lots of time reading scientific publications, mm -hmm. understanding them figuring out how they relate to their research and using it to plan future research or future scientific experiments. Um, and language models are quite well suited to help synthesize a lot of this information, help them extract information out of PDFs and just say like, okay, ask a question to these PDFs and get a very accurate mm. answer out of them. So we're focused on that. So it's not a chat interface. It's like, it's essentially a big table because that's what academics work in, like a big Excel table. Okay. And you're collecting papers in it and then you're extracting data out of each paper. You're saying, okay, Given these 20 papers, I want to know, you know, if, if you're a medical scientist, what dosage should they give the patients? How many patients did they test? You know, what gender and age were the patients? And you're kind of pulling these out into a big Excel table. Mm. So you understand all the important information in these papers without having to like sit there and scroll through every PDF. Yeah. And usually they're like copying and pasting these answers out manually. Yeah. That's the current process that people wow. do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's a very narrow workflow. It's like one specific thing we're helping people do. It's not sort of the chat approach of like, we help mm -hmm. you do whatever, you know, here's an open input. Um, it's much more specific. So it's probably more like traditional interface design, just with a much more powerful back end to it. That's interesting. Would you say that um, you sort of approach these um, researchers, I guess, maybe for lack of a better mm -hmm. word, is that you've sort of found out what is the format that they like and sort of fitted the AI to the format. So be, that way, in other words, it's not, not like a new thing they have to learn. It's the thing they already mm -hmm. use with amplified powers. Maybe that might be a way to describe it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We're, we're very much on the side of like, we want to speed people up. Not We're not replacing any like sort of human tasks right. here. I mean, we're trying to make them faster, right? If it we used to take you a hundred hours to read these papers, right. can we get you to do it in 20 minutes? Um, uh, and very much on the side of like helping people double check things, be very accurate because that's a problem with language mm. models. Um, just trying to be like, how do we do this in a way that you know science needs to be very rigorous? So, what's the rigorous approach to using? Mm. It? Now, it's you know there was something that struck me as you described what you were doing, sort of taking these mm -hmm. mass of information and trying to boil it down to the whatever facts mm -hmm. and information. It seems to me like large language language models are really good at taking factual information as long as you give guidelines to it and yeah. narrowing it down i think the challenge for large language models at least in my experience is generating mm -hmm. new stuff because it's yeah it's just got limited that you know you heard the term hallucinations where yeah i found yeah. that like if i ask the chat gpt to write out too long of a descriptive probably about three quarters of the way through it's like making stuff up um yeah right so and then you then you got the problem of reliability so you you know yeah. you can't just copy and paste that and say that you wrote it right you got to do a little bit more than that so anyway yeah yeah exactly like i think a lot of the current products and tools that are trying to put language models into the world are focusing on this generation right like writing right. an essay 
or write me a paper, mm-hmm. which I, I, I don't, yeah, I just don't think we're anywhere near accuracy or reliability no. or like sophistication levels to have them do that. So it's sort of, it's too early to even attempt that. Right. Um, but they can take, you know, you can give them a large amount of existing data and ask them questions about that data, a bit like a very advanced search algorithm, mm-hmm. a very mm-hmm. accurate advanced search algorithm, right? Like given these 10,000 PDFs, which one of them mentions this name, you know, or that kind of thing, or which one of these like talks about a certain theme, and then they can do quite advanced search to find those papers. Mm. Um, and and it's a totally different task to just have it from, given it's from its memory, you know, from everything it's learned from the internet, just like write me an okay. essay. It, yeah. It, yeah. It makes things up. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah. There was a thought that came to mind. It was, uh, uh, it's escaped me now. So I'll probably let it go. Maybe it'll come back later. Mm. Um, around language, large language models, uh, mm-hmm. kind of condensing information. Do you find that specifically in this case, does it do pretty well because you've given it such structured bounding that it does mm-hmm. pretty well with re- you know reliability and accuracy? Whereas you know the the opinion is well, you know, ChatGPT will it's going to hallucinate on us. Is it because it's sort of leaning it in towards its strengths as what it can do as condensing existing information and that point it's not doesn't have enough open space to like make things up is that is that generally tr- speaking true yeah that's that's about right like our approach to it is we combine language models with traditional programming like there's mm. some things that they're not well suited to do they can do very well defined like you said narrow scoped things if you just mm-hmm. say you know re- read these paragraphs and rank them to relevance to this question they're quite good at that kind of thing mm-hmm. um i think when they fall down is when you try to give them too big of a task that mm-hmm. would require too much sophisticated human reasoning or like research and knowledge to really complete well so we try to give them very tiny tasks and then we mm-hmm. string those together with other programming um i guess functions is what we would call it or actions. Right. So we'll use traditional word search, right, to find mm-hmm. things. And we'll use traditional sorting and ranking algorithms, but in combination with these language models for specific tasks that we think they can do well. I so see. it's not like a, a one call is what we would usually call it for chat. Yeah. Right? You ask one question, you get one answer. Instead, it's chaining together lots and lots of small language model tasks. Mm. And I think that goes to the old adage, right? To a guy with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Mm, right? if, you, yes. if you take this <laughs> AI and you think you can do everything, right, you're going to be you're going to be disappointed at some point. So it sounds to me like you're fine. Like, what does this tool do? Well, it's, it can do those things. And then there's other things it can't do, but there's other tools that will achieve that. So let's blend them together and make a combined tool that does the things that we want to. Exactly. Exactly. It's just putting them as another tool in the programming toolkit and not like the final answer to everything, you know, the final tool that we'll use to do all our Google searches and, Hmm. or our medical science work and you know now people are trying to use it for like graphic design a little bit of a different model yeah. on the back end but still it's like yeah you're trying to use it for to, for two complex things and and you're trying to be like well it can do everything and it's like well it really can't yeah <laughs> it's not even good at the things we're trying to make it do like we're just i think the hype is so far beyond the oh yeah at this point. i think so too yeah. the, the question that i lost came back to me and it's, this is totally like, you know, blue sky question, but like, so we know what, we know what Google search is now. We don't know what the algorithm is, but basically it has an algorithm that uses to find the most relevant stuff. It used to be how many people were linked to things was the old days. Now it's who knows what it does. So that's, that's mm-hmm. a known thing. It's been around for a while. Why do you, do you think, or maybe the question is, do you think that the large language models are so good at like taking lots of information and summarizing it which google search Mm -hmm. kind of can't do is it because Mm -hmm. of the structure like you talked about a neural network i assume that to to me that says that's modeled on the way our brains we think kind of work and are structured is that why it's Mm -hmm. better at that kind of an activity yeah so neural networks are based on human brains that was the original inspiration for the design behind them although they don't you know work exactly like human brains because we don't really understand brains that well yeah exactly yeah (laughs) yeah we weren't able to do that but that's the idea is they have these neurons um that kind of weight different information and then group them together probably Mm. in the way same way our brain does like Mm -hmm. if you think of you know you you hear one thing or you smell one thing and suddenly a whole different idea or memory comes back to you we're very Mm -hmm. good at associative memory and Mm -hmm. associative linking and it's a little bit like that like we have built a system where um 
things have uh, mathematical like relationships to each other, how similar they are in a mm. way that's much better than we've had before. So sort of if you imagined language models having like an, just an enormous brain of some sort or a neural network, <laughs> um, the words, right, king, queen, prince, those are all similar. They're in the same area, right. royalty. But then you're going to have in, things you wouldn't expect, like, um, you know, the band Queen might, you know, be somehow right. related to that. But in every direction, just think of every associative link you could possibly make all embedded in this model, which is what makes it kind of crazy mm. and fascinating. Um, so it's interesting with like web search, right? The way Google's traditionally done it is, a, as you've mentioned, right? Backlinking, some sort of legitimacy scores, you know, they do read the content and they try to judge, you know, yeah. does this answer the question or not? But in a more old school programming way that didn't have power of neural networks mm -hmm. and we assume they're re, you know rebuilding it or improving it because google was kind of um pioneered most of this ai research right right have been the last to implement it which is strange um but they should be able to kind of like do a very different approach to web search that yeah makes things much more relevant you know show up and that aren't seo spam um and be able to do summary i mean they're trying they have barred you know their chat bar, yeah. but honestly yeah. it's, it's not quite good um, but it should be a really powerful search engine for the web because mm. it should be able to do this associative linking between every bit of content on a page and really give you relevant results that aren't just someone yeah. like SEO hacking their way up with keywords. Right. You might say, well, if you like this, then you might like these other things, which is a real common sales thing, right? Like I think about Amazon doing that. Mm. I think I've noticed, I think, I think Amazon is using AI. It's more of a static. So I've noticed when I go to a page and I look at the reviews, for example, there's like mm -hmm. a descriptive at the top that I'm noticing. It's yeah, not yeah. one. It says most people think that this mm -hmm. tool is, you know, really great, but they don't like that it's too heavy or whatever the so it's obviously like I doubt there's a person doing this, right? There's some tool that's <laughs> compressing yeah. all these reviews and giving you a sense, an overview of that, right? Before you yes, dive I, into I, the, the mess. Yeah, I noticed that too on Amazon. It's like recent. It must have been yeah, the it's last like couple months. Couple months, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But that's a super useful like use case in an interface, right? You right. don't want to read 800 reviews and you can't. And you want to be like, listen, if most people mention this breaks in a few months, just tell me. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, you, you know, the, the thing that you're the tool that you're working on, I could see that being in a, like a as a tool that an individual would use for shopping, right? Go to Amazon. Yeah. I'm looking for this. Can you summarize uh, what are the best, mm -hmm. you know, you, you think about um, New York Times bought uh, wire cutter. Well, you could like do yeah. a wire cutter tool, right? That says, mm -hmm. go on all the internet and tell me the best uh, pair of shoes for this, these specific, I want to go hiking and it's got to be waterproof. Mm -hmm. And, you know, suddenly it would narrow down and give you not only the results, but then read through all the reviews and explain the pros and cons, you know, like somebody's probably already working on something like that, I suspect. Yeah, there are a couple companies working on essentially that that, that kind of tooling that I'm mm -hmm. I'm really excited about, but I still think they're at least a year away from mm. like, releasing something stable yeah. in public. But there are definitely people working on this problem, which I'm so happy about. Like, I, even for the last month, I've been starting trying to plan a wedding, and like I've been telling people this is the perfect <laughs> use case for language models because yeah. it's the most tedious, complex task. You are just oh, it is crawling through weird websites you're trying to put it in this big spreadsheet no you can't find anyone's budget you can't find anyone's phone number i was like i just need ai to do this why why am i doing this <laughs> yeah there you got a, a uh you know an idea for a software tool right the bride's ai right or something like that <laughs> i know it's got big money i'm not gonna do it but someone else should <laughs> yeah it's probably on it's in a boardroom someplace probably being pitched right now so yeah yeah <laughs> well um the I don't want to spend too long on LLM and language models and AI, but it's a really fascinating topic. I think, you know, maybe not everybody's thinking about it. I'm really curious about how it impacts sketch noting and visual imagery mm. because I haven't really played much with mid journey. That's a place mm. I need to explore, but I did for a month buy the, the, um, opening eye thing. And I tried the mm. Dolly, I think it is. And I asked it, yeah. <laughs> I said, okay, what would, how would I, how would I test this to see what it would do? I said, create a sketch note from um, Abraham Lincoln's uh, address, uh, mm. whatever the famous address was. And it came, it was weird. It came back with an image and it had like pictures of Lincoln and some of the things he said, but it, like, it was totally nonsensical. Like it was totally mm. useless. Like, so, I mean, as a sketch noter, I mean, I haven't tried mid journey. Maybe it can do better at this. Like, it seems like it can approximate the style of it, I guess. But like, you know, part of why people hire sketch noters or 
um, graphic recorders to go and sit, you know, like you said, you did these mm-hmm. where you're processing information. I mean, yeah. I guess technically an LLM could do that, right? I mean, that seems like a strength, but like maybe the output's still disconnected. It just seemed like, you know, that's a complex task. Like you talked about, you sort of limit it to these narrow tasks. Maybe there's someone that could put it all together and do something like that. But I don't know. I That's an unknown. I'm just sort of now rambling. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I, I feel maybe I'm at a similar place to you. Like I, uh, I played with Mid Journey a lot. I mm. got early access to the beta and I was kind of obsessed with it for a while mm-hmm. because it was mostly, it definitely has ethical issues and copyright issues, sure. but just as like a thing to go play with, I think it is worth people who are illustrators or graphic designers just doing that because you are able to query essentially every image we've put on the internet so far mm-hmm. and just it mostly it was the best game ever for like a week until i kind of like lost interest but you would just go on mm-hmm. and be like okay show me like rubrics cubes as if they're growing underwater and they're made of an algae or something and it would just give you gorgeous images of this wow. thing and you're like oh my god what what's the best game just you know take x and y combine you know add a weird style to it it was just like an infinite fun pictionary game or something like a reverse mm. pictionary i'm not sure what the, yeah. the analogy is but it was, it was so addictive because you just as someone who has spent their life making images to be able to just summon the, whatever you want yeah. obviously not in the way you would draw it or you would imagine it it's like querying someone else's visual memory um was fascinating so i do think it's worth playing with them but I'm on the same page as you were like, I have to make uh, visual images as part of my job, right? right? For just even like promotional pages or branding or my own um, essays. And I, I have tried a few times to prompt something like mid journey to yeah. get what I want for like a conference talk slide, but it just fails every time. Like no matter how long I spend going yeah. through cycles of prompting, I know what I want and it can't make it. And it certainly yeah. can't do my style. And yeah. it's just, we're not at a place right now where I think they're actually that useful. Yeah, I f- that was the same yeah. feeling I had. I had to use Dolly. And I had, a, so mm-hmm. I have a newsletter that I write every week at work. Mm-hmm. And I wanted, it was the hundredth episode. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun mm-hmm. to do like a, a Dolly illustration and see like, what does it come up with? And it was painful. Like, and it yeah. seemed to forget what it did before. So I would say, I would give it a modification like, oh, uh, spell that the spell uh, episode on the bottom right and then it would like totally change the design like no i don't want to change the design i just want to add this thing Mm -hmm. and it's not smart enough to like maintain the past and modify so my experience was frustrating now maybe there's tools that are better at this i don't know but i I just have a feeling that this is like you said it's a maybe too complex of a task to do both the processing and and the imagery and like connecting and that all together is just too far away which maybe is encouraging Um, for sketch noters and visual thinkers i don't know I yeah, know. oh, I would pay attention to what I haven't uh, personally used them, but I've seen some demos of this. The stuff Adobe is doing is quite interesting. Yes, because things like Mid Journey and Dali, like I definitely believe text is not the right input form for drawing because mm-hmm. that's crazy. Like all of us, when we sketch, we begin by making shapes, or yeah. you know, sometimes you might think of language to use metaphors, but you're really playing with physical forms, right? Can I make this mm-hmm. communicate the right thing and use the right, you know, uh, contrast and scale and everything to really make this image work? Um, so you need a canvas and you need a paintbrush and you need vector tools and like Mm -hmm. the AI could maybe be integrated into it in certain ways but in a more like find and replace or move this or you know improve the color and contrast on this but not in a way that's like I'm going to type words and you're going to give me the exact Mm -hmm. like composition I want it's not going to (laughs) happen yeah I think you know probably the most useful thing I've found for the the imagery generation things is like Mm. I'm stuck on something and I'll say, show mm. me 20 ways uh, this could be visualized. Or like you said, mm. you know, I want, um, you know, Rubik's Cubes made of algae, right? You could generate this now. You know, I think of it as like me searching Google for icon ideas, right? I wouldn't take the icon one to one. I would say, oh, that's interesting. What if I bent this little thing and I twisted that and I turned it this way? You know, like I would sort of put a little, my own twist on it or my perspective yeah. on it. And that, now that could be a valuable tool just as a way to break out or maybe think really weird like get some weird ideas and maybe that spurs you in a new direction as sort of a assistive tool right and not so much like well what i type in there is just going to slap it into my sketch note well that probably doesn't work right it's for many different reasons not least of which is the ethical part of it i suppose but um yeah yeah i I mean 
I was gonna say also references, uh, like, I don't know if you've tried it for this, like there have been one or two times where I know what I want to draw. And usually I would go to Google to get mm-hmm. references. And I've tried mid journey and I've been like, Oh, that actually kind of works. Like, oh, you know, I'm just sort of querying it for like a generic, like, give me a vase or something, or just give me yeah. a Rubik's cube, something where I'm like, you'll be able to do this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I do that all the time with like illustration projects where I'll say, I don't know, can't think of anything at the moment, like, show me a stickly chair, right? Well, that's mm-hmm. a physical thing that existed in time and has a certain, so, you know, Google that. I don't know why you couldn't also bid journey and it would, you could show it in three quarter view with, you know, light mm-hmm. from the left at sunset or, you know, whatever the prompt is, it would probably mm-hmm. give you a sense of that. Now, I guess you'd have to question like how accurate would a stickly chair look like if you have to have a stickly chair? Maybe the Google search is better because you would probably get photographs where mid journey might, you know, like give you seven fingers or whatever the <laughs> problem had, you know, you couldn't yeah. like hundred percent trust it. It would be 95%. Yeah. I don't know. Something like that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like you're going to get a slightly weird version of reality um, with mm-hmm. any of these generators. So maybe like you said, better for creative exploration or just kind right. of like breaking out of your box, but some come and then cross-referencing to Google if you really need to, Mm-hmm. to be accurate as a reference so it's basically describing what you're talking about with your tool which is we don't rely on one tool to do everything we kind of mix and match these capabilities you know based yeah. on what they do best which exactly yeah. you know so uh and this has really been fascinating i think i have the sense that you know mid journey and dolly and even chat gpt and the power that they have it's so for most regular people who aren't technologists, it just almost seems magical. And I mm. think um, it can also almost be a little bit scary, right? Because you don't understand, maybe even for the technologists that think they know, like sometimes mm-hmm. they're surprised at what it can do. So there's like this both excitement and like trepidation tied mm. to these tools. And I think, you know, sketch noters and visual thinkers probably need to address this because we tend to be tend to be early to problems. So I think it's an opportunity mm-hmm. more than a challenge to find ways that it can be integrated into your workflow in the right places. Right. So. Yeah, exactly. It's one of those where like, it's not going away. Mm-hmm. Like AI development is frankly going quite quickly at the moment, but even everyone mm-hmm. in the industry is still just kind of reeling from how fast developments are coming out, mm-hmm. which is quite overwhelming. Um, but they're, but they're not going anywhere and they're just going to get more sophisticated. So it doesn't help to sort of shun them or say, I'm not going to engage with this. You have to engage at some point. It's just, you want to do it now or later. Yeah. Yep. That's so, I mean, I guess for those who are listening, I mean, this is fascinating to me. I hope it was interesting to you. Obviously Maggie and I are both into it. So Mm. I think it's something, you know, to be aware of and to play with. And maybe that's your side gig is just going to mid journey and fooling around and seeing what Mm -hmm. it generates and, Maybe there's a way that can be integrated into the work you do. I think these tools have value. It's a matter of finding out where they fit into your process. So, This episode of the Sketchnote Army podcast is brought to you by Concepts, a perfect tool for sketchnoting, available on iOS, Windows, and Android. Concepts' vector-based drawing feature gives you the power to adjust your drawings anytime you like. You can nudge the curve of a line, swap out one brush for another, or change the stroke thickness and color at any stage of your drawing, saving hours and hours of rework. Vectors provide clean, crisp, high-resolution output for your sketch notes at any size you need, large or small. Never worry about fuzzy sketch notes again. Concepts is a powerful, flexible tool that's ideal for sketch noting. Search Concepts in your favorite app store to give it a try. So this is typically the point where I switch to tools. Now I know you, you say you still do some visual stuff. Are you primarily digital or you, do you still do physical stuff as a trained illustrator? I suspect there's still some analog tools that you maybe enjoy. Maybe you like getting with paper and pen to get away from your screens like me. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess I was always quite digital. Like I went to iPad quite quickly. Well, back mm-hmm. in the days I was on like a huge walk on <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. iPads really got good. Yeah. And they were just enormous and like you couldn't yeah. ever carry them anywhere. Um, I still definitely carry around like a little clipboard and a pen everywhere I go. Mm. Just so when I, it's funny, I use it mostly for thinking. I mean, like, as you know, right, this is with sketch noting, like diagramming and arrows mm-hmm. and like mapping out the shape of something mm-hmm. physically on paper, especially when I'm trying to write essays or put together, you know, I'm researching something and I'm trying to figure out the shape of the narrative. That's when I'm really like sketching little things and doodling and drawing diagrams. And I cannot do it 
on a screen because most apps, of course, are linear and text-based. Yeah, yeah. I need to do it physically with my body drawing on a piece of paper. So mm-hmm. it's incredibly basic, but I have like, you know, Univore signal pens, like the one pen mm-hmm. I will use and just a little carry around clipboard where I can like sketch little things and then throw the paper away. But it's the process of thinking with it. Yeah. I still love. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Uniball Signo is a great pen. I mean, that's, yeah. it's a great pen, pen and you can <laughs> get it at any, pretty much any shop, you know, the back of a bodega in New York city, you'd probably find a pack of those yeah. hanging on a yeah. rack someplace. So if you're, if yours fails, you can find one probably almost any place, which is a mm-hmm. huge advantage. Um, and then you do have like a looks like a half A4 sheet little uh, clipboard there. Is that yeah, like a- A5. Okay. Um, and I just buy like loose leaf A5 paper and then I huh. clip it to this tiny A5 clipboard because then nice. I'm not precious about the pages. I found with notebooks, yes. I was always worried of ruining them. So I can draw anything and I can keep it or I can check it away. And it's like flexible. I can draw things for other people and hand it to them. I've just found it's like the best system that works. Nice and flexible. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. even you could take photos of whatever you drew, right? If you wanted to store it in some way for future yeah. research, right? To bring it back, even if the original is gone. That's really mm-hmm. cool. I, you know, I have, I did a, a teaching event in Philadelphia and we had them produce these half letter size cardstock. I love those. They're just like the perfect mm. size. It's like the size of a notebook, but it's a loose sheet. Right. It's a little bit thicker. So I could use a Sharpie mm. on it. wouldn't bleed too badly. So that, mm. that was really great. I never thought to attach it to a clipboard. That's a really interesting idea. Yeah, well, my partner says it's the nuttiest thing ever that everywhere I go, I have this like clipboard in my bag that I just like pull out to like sketch something or take notes. He's just like, mm. it's just like the biggest teacher's pet. You just have like a tiny clipboard all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, what about your digital tools? You talked about a Wacom. I've had one of those too. They're, you know, not very portable, let's say. Mm-hmm. Talk about your iPad yeah. and what tools you like. Uh, I, I have one of the big iPads. It, it is wonderful. I use Procreate, right? It's kind of the best mm-hmm. iPad app. Uh, I do love drawing in there. Um, it's funny, though. There's like a digital tool I'm kind of obsessed with at the moment that I'm writing a piece on, so it's like very top of mind. It's, I guess, I'm trying to think of whether it's really visual expression, but I think it is part of the process for me. It is, um, there's been much, a, like a ton of advancements in voice-to-text technology. Mm. So you being able to talk and it being able to transcribe it perfectly and fast and immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so it's called Whisper. It's like from OpenAI. It's mm. like one of their things. And again, it used neural networks to learn how people sound and mm-hmm. translate that to text in a way that's way more accurate than we had before. So I mostly talk at my computer anymore. I don't actually type that much. So I just use voice and it's way faster. So for huh. writing and giving out first drafts or throwing around ideas, you just talk and it mm. all transcribes perfectly. Uh, and I've just found this has been such a change in my writing mm. process. And then which then becomes diagrams or drawings, but as part of writing. Um, but I've, that's currently my favorite digital tool. It's like this mm. new voice to text stuff. So you basically talk your article or whatever your the idea is. And then I su- I imagine you probably go back to an editor and then, oh, like that's that's dumb. Take that out or tweak that exactly. type that you're sort of now modifying everything to get to your final yeah. result. Exactly, exactly. It's very much like just getting out the first draft or the first ideas. You know, when you have this idea and you're quickly trying to type it down or write it down, it's so much easier to just say it. And, you know, voice notes are kind of uh, cumbersome or you have to go play them back and then transcribe mm. it again yourself. But it makes such a difference to just be able to quickly say your idea out loud and it's perfectly captured the way that mm. you said it. Um, I just found it's been such a difference in like low friction for people who are like trying yeah. to get started writing or can't find time to write. It speeds up writing a lot. Well, and I think there's people too, like podcasters and other voice people, they don't like writing or it's not, they don't feel natural doing it. They feel really natural speaking where mm-hmm. if that's you, where you're more of a talker than a writer, that might be a great way to get it in. And I guess the nice thing is it would capture your voice and sort of the way that you speak and all those things in a pretty accurate way that then when you go back and edit it, it's almost like you're listening to Maggie speaking to you. Like if you knew your voice, you could then imagine when I read this, you know, you talking, right? So, so it's, that's a really interesting side effect too. If you're not good at writing the way you speak, like mm-hmm. this might be a really interesting way to kind of capture that essence or at least more than you can now. So yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Whisper AI. Is yeah. For those- uh, or if you, so Whisper is like the the main model behind it, but there's an app mm-hmm. called Super Whisper. If you Google oh, that, okay. that's the other thing. That Super Whisper. It. I think it's for Mac and Windows. I think it's really good. It's a small app. Huh. It's very simple, but it makes it super easy to, to do it. Wow, really cool. Um, yeah. 
any other tools that you'd like to share uh, with uh, people Ooh. listening that, that, that help you? Mm, don't have that many more. I mean, yeah. So like iPad and Procreate, it seems so simple, but it's all I really use for illustration mm. at this mm-hmm. point and visuals. Uh, I, I've gotten really into GIFs over this last year, especially huh. in essays. Like I'll draw a small thing and just make a few frames of it. And yeah. then on desktop, like turn that into a little GIF. And I've just been like, oh, this is such a lightweight way to just add a little life to an animation mm-hmm. or an, an illustration, I mean. Um, so I've loved doing that. I did, I've never really thought before about how flexible and like portable GIFs are. Like video yeah. on the web is Play tricky. every place, yeah. But GIFs just, you know, it just loops. And, and, and you can just make a few small animations. And it, it kind of opens you up to the world of animation. I think I remember going to your site and it was the, the digital gardening article mm-hmm. am i right in saying i was sitting there reading it and all of a sudden something moved like what happened i thought there was like a little <laughs> animation of like a butterfly or something is that am i right in remembering that uh i think one on of those piece? might have maybe it was a different um, piece yeah so some of them do have i think it only started doing it in the last year that one might okay. have I w- yeah um, there was on one of them. of them i put yeah. scroll ones on so as you scroll they yeah. just animate yeah yeah so i thought that was really cool because it looked like a static image but as mm. I interacted with it, it started having life to it. I thought, oh, that's really cool. It's really subtle. It's not, you know, not flashing mm-hmm. type or something that's giving me epileptic seizures or anything like that. So <laughs> yeah, that's most guess. <laughs> a really well done, really tastefully done uh, animation that gave it some interest and made me smile a little bit, right? It made me a little mm. bit happy just to see that. Like, oh, that's cool. Mm. Yeah. It's yeah. Cool. I want to get better at that stuff. Like, especially the like mm. scroll interactions or cursor interactions. They're so mm. simple. But you mm. can add just a little bit of movement or information or life to an image. Mm-hmm. If on the web, you can layer in these kind of interaction bits. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, definitely, mm-hmm. if you're listening, we're going to have show notes. Uh, go to go to Maggie's site and read her essays. They're excellent. Uh, I've enjoyed every one of them. So um, let's shift now to tips. So in these can mm-hmm. since you're you have visual background, but maybe it's more. We can open it up to whatever you'd like. I just asked mm-hmm. for guests to give three tips for people that are listening. Um, I sort of usually frame it as imagine somebody's, you know, stuck and they just need some inspiration. What would you say to that person? So, I mean, you can take that or you can, any kind of tips that you'd like to share would be great. Sure. Sure. Hopefully it's won't be too repetitive from what we've talked about, but now I'm like, Oh, these are like top of mind things. We just <laughs> said, people yeah, do. yeah, yeah. Um, one is definitely, yeah. Playing with gifts. I, I just had never thought about them before. To me, they mm. were like, Oh, them just means, um, I'm really just reading a basic amount about how gifts work and the technology behind them and like how you can make simple ones just maybe be like, Oh, this is such a fruitful medium that I think most people don't explore. So for someone that makes images already, just trying to make a gift, it's like probably going to open you up to be like, Oh, I never thought about, you know, a three sequence image or like mm-hmm. a little interactive image. Um, some of one, a little new medium to play with. Um, Second, I'd say we already touched on this, but like if you haven't played with Mid Journey or mm. Dali, I prefer Mid Journey. I think it yeah, does. I think it's, it's a more bit interesting. Better. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's kind of worth just paying for a single month and then mm. just exploring and treating it like a game, not thinking you're going to make final artwork out of this or you use mm. anything. Just be like, I'm playing a video game right now, mm. and I can query this to to show me anything I want. And I love just being like. Noun plus noun plus style plus verb or something, you know, mm. like Mad Libs, but with this crazy image memory machine that's just like somehow synthesized all the images you've already made. So mm. it's just wild to play with. I think it is worth understanding what's possible in it and what's not possible. Mm. I think it's good too yeah. that you make it think of it as a game. So you kind of give mm-hmm. it like you're, the way you approach it is as much important as the tool itself because then, you know, your expectations lower. You know, mm-hmm. your your opportunity for being, you know, surprised go up. If mm-hmm. you're not like, if oh, I have to achieve this and it's got to be done by Friday, that changes the way you approach a tool than just, hey, let's just see what it can deliver. Let's play. Yeah. Which is good. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, that was, I think just playing with that might be fruitful for, for ideas or new styles, but might just be a fun time where you kind of learn to understand what these are possible for as like we mm-hmm. kind of move forward in the world of AI yeah. generation. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, I mean, I kind of want to um, encourage people to, um, I don't know, if, I, I assume your audience would know about this stuff. What I think of is like interactive visual essays. Have you seen like the stuff the New York Times does that's like yes. very rich scrolling, yeah. like beautiful animations as you go? Mm-hmm. I've, been, I've been obsessed with these for a long time, right? These have been around for ages. We call it scrolly telling for a minute. 
but this sort of like long form writing that is like richly supported by visuals and animations and it's all intertwined like the writing and the images all go together just like mm -hmm. in sketch notes there's no kind of separation of yeah of me. Blended. Mm -hmm. yeah and ones on the web that do this i think are especially magical because you get that interactivity and you can kind of hover and scroll and and they can react to that um exploring those i just don't think there's enough of this on the web right now and i'm kind of like mm. it maybe it's too hard maybe it's too complex as a medium for people to work in um but going and exploring some of these interactive essays or like long form visual essays i think is one way to really open up your practice to think about how you could mm. like write a piece and then integrate images into it or like add animation into it i'm trying to do this much more so i'm kind of pushing on this at the moment that everyone is into writing and they're into writing like right. words and, yeah. and just words and i'm like what's where's you should have like an image every paragraph or you should have you yeah. know something that flows through the all these words um i think blending words and images are when things get really interesting not just in comic book form but we could be doing this in a whole new way on the web yeah even in a low-tech way i could see that happening where especially people listening to this sketch noters mm -hmm. visual thinkers where you could have the written text and then based on that do illustrations or sketch notes yeah. or whatever you want to call it yeah. and then Igor and all they would have to be you can make them full with you know mm -hmm. with a lot of these tools will allow that so you get to this point and suddenly you know you get this full width image that sort of takes up and you have to pass through it right if you think about it mm -hmm. as a scrolling thing like it doesn't have to be complex you don't have to do crazy animations yeah. just bold imagery and text the, the text you mm -hmm. choose the size of the text all those things can make it a really compelling thing and tell a story so it's yeah. definitely yeah. approachable by regular people with just like a square space or a, you know, Tumblr exactly. or whatever, or WordPress, you can produce these things with a little bit of yeah. exploration. So yeah. interesting. Yeah. But most of the ones on my site aren't technically complex at all. They're a static image just intertwined with the words or mm -hmm. small mm -hmm. doodles, like as breakers in between paragraphs. There's only a handful that really are more technically complex. I'd say. And it's interesting that you don't need really much, like just a little bit really can give it the spice and flavor and make and cha totally change the perception right it doesn't have to be crazy mm -hmm. a crazy project it can just be a few little tidbits in the right places which is pretty cool mm -hmm. everybody can yeah. do it everybody can do it mm -hmm. well this has been really great thanks maggie it's been so good to have you on the show um tell us what's the what is the website we should go to should we are there social media places where you hang out the most those kind of things where people can go, go and see your work and We'll, of course, make show sure. notes and connect, collect all these things for you as well. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, maggieappleton.com is my website where I write and publish things. I do spend a lot of time on Twitter still until mm. it dies, which <laughs> may, may, may be coming happen. soon. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and that my handle is mappleton, so like M Appleton S on mm. there, but it's linked on my website. Um, and then if you're a researcher or a scientist, um, illicit.com is, is the mm. company I work for. It's worth checking out, but it's really like, for, yeah, maybe intense researchers. I think other people might be like, what is, <laughs> what is this complex table yeah. thing you're trying to yeah. use? <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm always surprised at who listens and who's in this community. I'm, I know several physicists that are in this community that use sketch noting all the time. Oh, so cool. I never, I never like lower my expectations for who might be here. So you might be surprised. Yeah. There might be some people in this community that like, what you make that. And then they'll, they'll sign <laughs> cool. up, right. Or cool. whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, thanks so much for all the work you do. I'm really impressed with the work that you've done and sort of your approach and your attitude. So thank you for your contribution to the world. It's been, I appreciate it. And I wanted to let you know, that and i think a lot of people other people appreciate it too so thank you thank you so much for having me this is a wonderful chance to chat and, and i love the whole community you've built here i feel like i've been following it for like a decade at this point so i appreciate the success <laughs> well you're you're so welcome and we're, we're happy to have you as part of it so for everyone who's listening or watching this is another episode until next episode talk to you soon the sketch note army podcast was created by me mike Rody, and brought to you by Rody design studios it's produced and edited by Alec Polianis of Amp Creative Studios. The theme music was created by John Schiedemeyer. To support the creation of this show, I invite you to buy one of my books, The Sketchnote Handbook or The Sketchnote Workbook. You can find the books on Amazon or go to peachpit.com and use the code RODY40 for 40% off. Please share this podcast with other visual thinking friends and be sure to leave a nice rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast listening app so others can find the show. 